Um, which is wonderful. I'm Josh Ginsberg. I'm the president of the Cary Institute. I'd like to welcome you tonight. Uh, for those of you who have not previously been to a Friday night at Cary, uh, I'd like to point out, as I have taken the habit of doing, the little labels on the back of people's chairs. Um, and you might wonder why some people have labels on the back of their chairs. Those are for our Aldo Leopold Society members. Uh, those are uh, some of the most important supporters of the Cary Institute. And it's one of the few things we can do to thank them to make sure they have a reserved seat uh, at these lectures. I urge you to get your own reserved seat and uh, there's a piece of paper on the way out that you can pick up. Uh, the money that we get from our donors really does help with a lot of things, including the public outreach uh, parts of our programs, uh, which includes the Friday nights, the Earthwise radio program, and the ability from April through October uh, to go and, and hike and bike on our trails. Uh, it's a gorgeous time of the year to get out onto the property, so if you're not doing so, I urge you to do so. If you feel that you need company, um, on October, I'm sorry, September 26th, uh, Charlie Cannon is a forest ecologist, uh, and I say a forest ecologist, but I can almost say the forest ecologist, uh, along with uh, uh, Gary Lovett and a guy named Jerry Jenkins, who works at the Wildlife Conservation Society, uh, but really one of the world's experts on temporary forests. And Charlie is going to lead a forest ecology walk in the Wapentures Creek, uh, along the Wapentures Creek in the Cary Institute property. Um, it will be great. Uh, Charlie has an ability to talk about historical ecology and the history of what you are seeing and the way in which human actions and land uses uh, can be reflected in the ecology of the forest 100 years later. So I, I urge you to sign up for that. Um, our next Friday night lecture is on October 23rd, uh, Friday, October 23rd, and that will be a man named Michael Tennyson. Michael was the first of our Canoe Hill uh, arts, artist in residence uh, scholars. Uh, the Artists in Residence program brings fine artists, performing artists, uh, and writers to the Cary Institute to interact with our scientists and to make art on the basis of it. Uh, part of what came out of uh, Michael's time here is a book called The Future of Evolution, The Next Species, part of it, The Future of Evolution and the Aftermath of Man. And it's, it's a sort of somewhat uh, ecologically dystopian uh, book about what the world could look like after people. Um, I've read about half of it, so I'm only halfway through, but, it, but it's a fascinating read, and uh, a bunch of carry scientists um, play a part in it, so I urge you to come to that as well. Um, finally, on October 25th, uh, a couple days later on Sunday, uh, if you join the Alma Leopold Society, we have an Autumn Glory, which is a walk and a cocktail party on the property, uh, so if you're thinking of becoming a member, that might be another good reason to do so. All right, so that's the preamble, now the amble. Um, I take tremendous pleasure in introducing uh, Dr. Annette Bonjou, our speaker tonight. Um, she's the Vice President for Strategic Initiatives and the Great Eight Programs at the Arcus Foundation. The Arcus Foundation is the largest private funder of Great Eight Conservation in the world. Uh, they have about a $10 million budget and do remarkable things with it. Uh, like most field biologists, Annette is able with her staff to make every dollar count three or four times over. Um, and then has spent uh, a number of years uh, doing some very, very hard field work in places like the Democratic Republic of Congo uh, and in Rwanda. Um, you know, her, probably her, the, the thing that um, leads every bio for her, that is that she, for 15 years, ran the uh, Mountain Gorilla uh, program for um, uh, the collaboration that is the International Gorilla Conservation Program, usually called IGCP. It's a collaborative of three conservation organizations that alone having three masters is a challenge. Uh, but Annette arrived in Rwanda in 1991, just a couple years ahead of the genocide. And I think one of the things that is most remarkable, and we look for happy stories in conservation, is that by the time she left 15 years later, the real populations had increased, the sustainability of that program had improved, and in general, uh, what people would have thought would be one of the hardest places in the world to do conservation, probably only second to working on uh, bonobos in, in the Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, which she also spent years doing, uh, and been successful. So I, I think that is a really remarkable achievement. Um, you know, in, in her spare time, uh, she finds uh, the time to write and edit books. There are two books for sale, and I highly recommend both of them. One is called Mountain Gorillas, Biology, Conservation, and Coexistence, and it's really the last word, or at least the current last word, on Mountain Gorillas. And another called The Politics of Species, and that's a really remarkable book because it looks at the way humans define otherness and other species and the way in which we use that to separate ourselves 
uh, from the plight of the rest of the world, the other eight and a half million species uh, with whom we share this planet. So uh, it's an honor to have Annette here tonight. Um, I'd like to thank CARI trustee uh, Tom Lovejoy, who sort of orchestrated this. Uh, thank you, Tom. And uh, you know, the floor is yours. tonight and to speak about something that is so close to my heart. Um, in my talk today, I'd like to jump around a little bit from the intimate and personal and close up my experiences to the coolly objective and analytic. And the reason I say that it is cool is because it's in some respects arrogantly clinical. It's the perspective of conservation from a human being. And yet, we are but one species on this planet. And yet we feel that the world and all its resources, land, water, air, everything else, is there for our well-being, for our use, for our exploitation, and our self-interest. And we know, or we think we know, what's best for us, ourselves as humans, and for the planet, and to further our interests. And we take decisions on what happens in this world for us, which improves our lives. Yet, our perspective, and the us I'm talking about, is the perspective of a human being from the industrialized world. And that's no more real and no more significant than the perspective of any other being, any other human or any other creature anywhere else on this planet. And they all have their own desires for well-being and self-interest and comfort. My viewpoint is based on 21 years of working in conservation with apes in Central Africa, from, starting from 1985 to 2005, and then since then, 10 years of working to support different conservation programs of apes across tropical Africa and Southeast Asia. And it's the perspective of a European white woman working outside of Europe in Africa and Southeast Asia, furthering interests that I believe are for the benefit of the planet and for people and for wildlife all over. And yet, and it's a genuine belief, I genuinely believe I'm doing something that's good for the planet. Yet, I'm not sure everybody would see things from the same perspective as I do. Now, I fell into apes. That it's not, I didn't choose apes because I found them more interesting than any other species. I could equally have studied countless other interesting, sentient, intelligent beings. But when I was 24 and I was traveling around finding my feet in what was then called Zaire and now the Democratic Republic of Congo, I was exploring a little bit and I spent some time working doing some surveys of mongoose or contributing to surveys of mongoose and other vivarids across the Congo Basin as well as looking at some tree frogs. And I bumped into some people who were working with bonobos. And so I spent some time working with bonobos. And that's it. I realized this is something that's extremely interesting. The bonobos were, at that time especially, very little studied, very little was known about them. Everything was new. And they're fascinating, fascinating creatures. And so Zaire became my habitat. And from 1985 to 1987, I worked with the bonobos. And from 1987, I worked with chimpanzees for, for three years. And then from 1991, I worked with the mountain gorillas. And as Josh said, I spent 15 years working with the mountain gorillas. My fate was sealed and I never looked back. All these apes are endlessly fascinating animals. But so are most animals. And really, when you take the time to go deep, and to really try to understand what you're seeing, they're all fascinating and it's astounding the depths at what you find. Our biggest failure as humans is our ignorance and this ridiculous belief that we are more than other species. More important, more intelligent, more sentient and more valuable in some inexplicable way. Apes and the forests that they inhabit are enormously threatened. All of them. All the apes are listed as endangered and threatened or threatened by the IUCN. 
And in every country where they exist in the wild, they are legally protected. And yet they are becoming more endangered and more threatened every year. So the legal protection doesn't stop people from hunting, capturing, and eating them. Nor does it stop people and companies, both national and international, from destroying their habitats for extraction of resources and exploitation of the land. And that leads directly to their extermination. Direct and indirect actions with the consequences that we are losing ape habitats and losing ape lives all across the world. Apes face three main threats, habitat destruction and degradation, hunting and live capture, and disease. And apes are very vulnerable to many of the diseases that humans are also vulnerable to. And habitat destruction and degradation is probably the greatest threat at a, a, a global scale to apes. And there's a number of drivers of those threats. Obviously, economic development, our agriculture, our logging, our mining, oil and gas, all of these industries are destroying habitats and therefore impacting ape populations. There's also growing middle class in many of the countries where apes are found and growing purchasing power with more <coughs> consumption, more waste, and therefore a greater impact on the habitats. And of course, we can't deny human population growth and how rapid the number of people are increasing worldwide, and therefore also their needs for land, for resources, and for everything else to keep them alive. And globalization with the trade and the movement of resources from one end of the world to the other breaks down the barriers that used to exist, limiting impacts to a relatively small scale. And again, diseases which are leading to the loss of many ape populations. If you look at the world global human population, in 1987, July 1987, I remember well we hit the 5 billion mark, and that sounded enormous. In 2050, we're going to hit the 10 billion mark, and that's how fast the human population is growing. But what, this is going to have far-reaching consequences on ape populations and all endangered terrestrial and aquatic species worldwide. And it leads to habitat de degradation when people start needing the land for the cultivation of food. And you get these degraded and eroded landscapes which are prone to erosion and become poorer and poorer with time. And what's left are these tiny fragments of forest surrounded by vast plantations. This is oil palm plantation in Southeast Asia with this tiny fragment of forest. And that's all that's left for the wildlife. That's where they have to survive. And there are very few corridors connecting these small islands together so that apes or any other species living in a small forest fragment like that hasn't a chance of crossing these vast expanses of plantations which are sometimes hundreds of kilometers wide. And each of these threats affect apes in different ways. Gibbons, which are the small apes found all across Southeast Asia and Indonesia and Malaysia, they're probably the most affected by the destruction of habitat. And that's largely because they're almost exclusively arboreal. They do not like to come down to the ground and cross areas on the ground. So when the forest is cleared, or when trees are planted like palm oil plantations where the palm fronds are not very good for arms swinging your way across, they get trapped in these little islands of forest. Probably some of the apes that are the most able to adapt are chimpanzees. And they can survive in degraded landscapes and they can move around from area to area, provided that there's enough food. But the consequence of that is that they are significantly affected by hunting across Africa. And often they enter into people's fields because they're searching for food in an area that used to be forest, and then they get killed by people because they're seen as problem animals. And so they become victims of the fact that they can adapt and can start utilizing human land, uh, land that's used by humans. It was always thought that orangutans can only survive in primary forest and that the only orangutans that were left were, left were in the national parks. What we're finding now is that more than 60% of orangutans actually live outside 
protected areas outside national parks. The bad news is that those are the areas that are being cleared. And this is a photograph of a tree with an orangutan at the top of the tree. And this is what's happened to his forest habitat. And he's stuck up there. There's no way he can come down and cross and find another forest. So that orangutan actually was rescued by a sanctuary group who then translocated him to another forest area. Apes are very intelligent, and many of them have learned to adapt, have been forced to adapt to this constantly changing landscape. Changes that have been largely caused by humans to make the landscape productive for our consumption and for our use. In all of my conservation work and, and the work of most conservationists, it's been to look at that changing landscape and to look for ways to make conservation possible within that reality. We are changing the face of the world. And the human population is changing, as we said earlier, very rapidly. Is it sustainable? No. We know that twice the number of people that we had in 2005 isn't sustainable. And yet, we know that there are going to be increasing problems with water, with land, with other resources. But we have to remember that the biggest challenge today isn't just the number of people. It's also the disparity in the access to basic resources that people have. Most people on this planet do not have access to the resources that the few privileged do have access to. They don't have access to enough water and enough food to survive. And everybody, understandably, wants to be able to survive comfortably. When people get richer, they also start to consume more. They eat more meat. They produce more waste, they eat more processed food, and all of that is very wasteful of energy. So as we're succeeding to bring people out of poverty, and the world is succeeding, there are fewer people, proportionately fewer people living in extreme poverty now than there were before. People are getting richer, and that's a wonderful success story, but we're not necessarily solving the problems because although there are fewer poor people, the people are consuming more resources as they have the ability to buy and to consume. So things are not sustainable, and we know that they have to change. But we also know that they inevitably will change. People will learn, and they will adapt to the situation. Our challenge as conservationists is, to, is not to stop people from making their livelihoods. It's not to halt development. Our challenge is to find ways to make conservation possible within the context of development and reducing poverty and helping people better their lives. So it's decoupling economic development from the environmental consequences, the negative environmental consequences that economic development has so often been associated with. And it's not going to be enough to designate some areas as national parks or protected areas where, which are no-go zones because we need far more land than we will ever designate as no-go zones. Now, I'm not saying we don't need no-go zones, and I think we need to really reinforce and strengthen our commitment to no-go zones. We have world heritage sites that people are now starting to exploit. Um, the Arctic, the Antarctic, these are areas which need to be left intact, and we need to keep them protected for very obvious reasons. Based on the projected growth of the human population and the anticipated associated global increase in demand for agricultural products, we estimate that we're going to need to increase by 60% the amount of agricultural land from 2005 to 2050 to meet that anticipated global demand. And that's a huge increase. Where is that land going to come from? Agricultural production is declining in developed countries, and it's increasing in the tropics. We need an estimated 700,000 kilometers squared of land to meet the demand for this growing human population. And it's in developing countries that it's expected that that land will be converted. Probably, we need a projected 1.2 3 million kilometers squared of land from Sub-Saharan Africa and Latin America. And these, as we know, are the tropical ecosystems that have the highest biodiversity and species richness 
on the land. And those are the lands that are being looked at for agricultural development. Now, much of what we know about the impacts of agricultural development on species and ecosystems is from looking at palm oil development. It's one of the most studied crops. Far less is known about the impacts of coffee, rubber, tea, sugar, soy, corn, and all the other products that we grow. But only palm oil and coconut oil, are they are the only vegetable oils that are grown exclusively in the tropics. Many of those other products are grown in other areas as well. And palm oil constitutes 40% of the vegetable oil consumed worldwide. It's huge. And if you look at this map, the areas that are considered suitable, and this is purely from the perspective of somebody who wants to grow palm oil, is in the Amazon Basin and the Congo Basin. Where it's being grown is in Indonesia and Malaysia, mainly Borneo and Sumatra and those areas. So that's where you have the biggest bubble. But where it's not yet being grown in any huge scale, and where it's bright red because it's considered very suitable for palm oil production is in the Amazon Basin and the Congo Basin. So we can draw our own conclusions of what's going to happen to the biodiversity in these areas if this goes forward. And we need only look at the forests of Borneo, where much of the palm oil is currently grown, to see how deforestation has affected those habitats in that island. And if you overlap um, where the um, industry are and where the orangutans live, then you see that there's a neat overlap and there's very little habitat left for orangutans in Borneo. So it's a scary, scary scenario, a very difficult situation that we're in, and it's alarming. And yet, none of this is new. We have known about the impacts of palm oil cultivation and forest destruction on apes. And we know what it looks like for forests and the burning of peat and the impact this has on the carbon, on the planet and uh, climate change. And we've been talking about these issues for decades, since the 60s. And there have been changes. I'm not so negative as to deny how much change has been made. And we have started to really realize the impact of local actions at a global scale, like pollution, like the burning of peat, like cumulative deforestation. And all of this is leading to global climate change. But we still have this mental block. And we still have this absolute and unquestioned faith in an economic paradigm that's based on consumption and growth and extraction. And coupled with our species, our human species' tendency towards short-term planning and looking at the consequences of things in the immediate but not thinking far ahead and making, taking actions now that will protect the lives of future generations, we are really plunging over the edge of the cliff, to put it in a rather negative way. Um, we need to think about those future generations, and we need to think beyond our own immediate interests today. People don't generally focus on the common good anymore. We focus on what's close to us, ourselves, our families, and what we call our circle of inclusion. And that circle of inclusion includes humans, but it doesn't necessarily include non-human species. And in most modernized and industrial countries, we look at land and minerals and the sea and even water and air as free and there for us to use and exploit for our consumption. We extract what is economically viable to extract, not what is appropriate, ethical, or even sensible. Because we feel like if we don't extract it, somebody else will come and extract it. So what do you do about this and how can you change this? How do you achieve behavior change? How do you get people to realize I've got to do something, even though it's a small action, and I've got to do it now because of the consequences in the future. Figures and quoting these alarm calls and saying how desperate the situation is, it doesn't work. It's not enough. We've learned about it at school. We've read it in the press. We've all heard it many times. And I believe we really only take action when it becomes personal and close and touches us in a very emotional, 
and intimate way. So <coughs> coming back to that short attention span that we have and that what we call our circle of inclusion. We care about those people that are close to us and that matter to us. And so I'd like to just illustrate that with this example of the refugee the Syrian crisis in Europe. Speaking as a European, these are from some of the papers in Europe. And we had horrific language for the longest time about mobs of people coming across from Syria. Photographs that almost look scary, like you're going to be run down by these crowds of Syrians migrating into Europe. And it was all very negative. And people were really talking about, we've got to block this, we've got to stop this. And then little Aylan was killed or died. And the pictures in the papers were so poignant. And we saw his little three-year-old body and his tiny little shoes. And suddenly the conversation changed. And people started talking about refugees. And they started talking about humanity and needing to bring the people in and help them and consider um, the care and the horrors that these people were living through. So it became a crisis that became close to us because we could identify as a parent and as a human being to this tiny little child who lost his life. And that's why we focus on the personal and why we focus on charismatic species like great apes because they are able to draw our attention, to speak to us, and to make us identify with the issues. When we look at what's happening to the apes, people care. When we talk about some of these challenges, and you talk about environment and biodiversity and habitats and all of that, it's very hard to identify it when you then talk about the personal and the intimate, suddenly it becomes real and it becomes something that matters. And for me, getting to know the individual apes when I work with them, in this case the mountain gorillas, and starting to realize that they each have personalities and each of them is also has social bonds. And this is a silverback with his small offspring and is, uh, they play together. They have emotional connections with each other. Suddenly their lives matter. It's not just about population and species. It's also about individuals and individual animals. For example, Salama was a silverback who loved looking at his reflection in your camera lens. Mm -hmm. And whenever you were holding a camera, especially you know, a nice big telephoto lens, he would come right up to your camera and look at himself and touch it. And he just was utterly fascinated. He would allow his little babies to come right up to you as well to look at themselves in the camera lens. Another example is Luawa, another silverback male who figured out that the snares that people set in the forest to capture antelope and other small game, he figured out that they were dangerous and that gorillas and other animals got caught in them. And he learned how to break them. And he'd walk through the forest just snapping the snares when he saw them. <laughs> Even if none of his gorillas, none of his family were nearby. These are intelligent, interesting, fascinating individuals, each of whom has a personality and a life and a desire for comfort and well-being. So this whole issue of wanting to better yourself and wanting to live well is not just about humans. It's not just about what we want and what we need to live well. It's also about what they want and what they need. So I have countless stories like that of different individuals, whether they are gorillas, whether they're chimpanzees and, and others. But the point that I'm trying to make is that their lives, their individual lives matter, like ours do. And each of them is an interesting individual creature. And we need to be more generous to the individuals that live on this planet, whether they're human or non-human. We have so much to learn from them, and our lives, and life in general is so much better with them. And I'd like to end this um, talk with just a, a little anecdote, um, which in, in my case gave me a lot of um, thought. And it really made me think about gorillas and who they are and what processes are going on in their minds. Um, so I'd like to share that with you. And it's, it's a, a case where 
we were walking through the forest together with a filmmaker who was filming, uh, making a movie about gorillas, uh, Bruce Davidson. And we, as we were approaching the group, the family that we wanted to, um, to see, we heard a lot of commotion, a lot of screaming, a lot of thumping of the ground, chest beating. The gorillas were clearly very, very agitated. Um, we had no idea what was going on, but we went closer and closer, and we got charged by the silverback. He would come roaring at us with his mouth wide open, and you know, you must remember that a head of a gorilla is this size. He weighs 250 kilos, approximately. Um, I don't know what that is in pounds, but it's big. It's very big. And his arms and biceps are you know, like this. They're, they're trees. And he would come roaring out of the bushes, and he'd slap the ground really hard, and he'd roar in the faces, in our faces. And we were obviously extremely intimidated, but we realized there's something going on. He's very upset. He's not normally at all upset with us. So we inched closer and inched closer and saw that an infant in his group was caught in the snare. And the rope was around his hand, and they'd been there for several hours, and the infant was pulling and pulling and trying to get loose, and it was just getting tighter and tighter and cutting into his hand. And he was in pain. He was crying, constantly whimpering. The mother kept coming up to him and holding him and suckling him. And then she'd try to leave with him, and he'd get yanked out of her arms because he was attached to the snare. And clearly the gorillas did not know what was going on. They were very agitated. The silverback was charging us over and over and came very, very close. And we got down on our hands and knees and were be being very submissive, as, as you do when a gorilla is charging you, and <laughs> inched our way forward slowly to get closer because we realized we have to free this baby from the snare. We can't leave it there. It, it will die. And so every time we came closer, the, the silverback charged us. And at one point, the silverback grabbed Bruce's hand and held it just like that, with his fang, you know, with his big canines, right on his hand. And he just looked him in the eyes with this intense look. And of course, Bruce was terrified. And, you know, he just sort of put his head down and let his hand limp in this mouth of the gorilla. And then the gorilla let go and stormed off. And he looked at his hand, there was no mark on it. And he hadn't broken the skin, there was nothing, not a scratch, nothing yet he could have bitten right through. And he was so agitated and upset and not wanting us to get closer. And I think, I believe, he was warning us in the only way he could, don't come closer. <clears throat> and, but we didn't listen, of course, and we <laughs> did inch closer. And it took quite a while, and finally Bruce was able to take out his little Swiss Army knife and cut the snare loose, and um, so he got that close to the baby, and, and boop, they were gone. And for me, the, the incident reminds me of how powerful that gorilla is. And he chose not to use that aggression against us. He, he very effectively warned us. But he did not use his aggression. He could have been. He could have slapped us. He could have done anything. And it would have been justified. But he didn't. He chose not to. And it made me think about him as a father of this, of this young baby, and the worry that he had, and the fear that he had, and the control, the self-control that he showed, because he did not just slap us and get rid of us. So I'd like to just leave you with that story and um, think about it, and think about the lives of these animals, and the changes that we need to make in order to make it possible for them all to continue to survive. So thank you very much.
he would have stopped us from coming any closer. Um, so, no, there was nothing that I could say, oh, that was so obvious, he, 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 he recognized it. But we saw him many times afterwards, and he was very gentle and very calm with us. I think he was incredibly agitated. I don't think he truly, completely understood what was going on. And when it was over, and when the baby shot into its mother's arms, and they all took off, they were just relieved to be able to go. But I don't know what he was thinking. And, and it's the mystery that always stays with you when you work with wild animals. You don't really know what they're thinking. And that's the wonder, it's the magic of it as well. Yes? I, uh, I would love to do something to change the trajectory, but I don't know what to do. Can you give us all some ways in which we can help impact this scenario? Corporations, there's government. It's very complex. Yes, it is incredibly complex, and and it's easy to feel powerless and to feel like, as an individual, as one person, what can you do to change the world? And, and even when you're a whole lot of individuals, what can you do to change the world? But I think each and every one of us has one tool which is incredibly powerful, and that's our tool as a consumer. Now we can make choices about what we buy, how much we buy, and where we buy things from. And there is good advice that exists now on sustainable products, not wasting products, and also choosing to support those companies who are spending more money and making the effort to be sustainable, and choosing not to buy those products where companies are not <coughs> making those decisions. So you could buy certified palm oil products which are products made with palm oil that has not involved any deforestation. And if you choose to buy them, and not the ones that disregard the deforestation issues, they will go out of business over time. The more people that make those deliberate choices as a consumer, and make the economic choices that they all depend on, the more you will influence what happens. And I can guarantee if everybody was to stop buying uncertified palm oil products. There would no longer be uncertified palm oil on the market because they can't sell the products. It's, it's a small grain of sand in an ocean, but if each of us makes those kinds of decisions about microplastics, about palm oil, about the timber, the paper, the, all the products, the clothing that we use, the, the dyes that are in the fabrics that we buy, it takes a bit of work, it takes a bit of effort because you need to do some research, you need to be you know, pretty self-controlled about not buying that thing that you actually like, but buying something else. But it, every time you take a cup, a plastic cup, and throw it in a bin without recycling it, it is going into the ocean. That's exactly where it's going. So you know that every single time you throw that plastic cup in the bin without recycling it, you are going to end up, that's going to end up in microplastic pellets in the belly of an albatross or a sea turtle or some other creature. So make that connection and make those choices. And I think they're incredibly powerful. <coughs> yes? Well, I just wanted to offer um, to that lady and anyone else who's interested. There are many websites, as you're referring to, but um, you can specifically go to deforestationeducation.org. So it's easy to remember, deforestationeducation.org. And also, the rainforestalliance.org has a conflict palm oil site. And they'll actually give you lists starter lists for shopping of specific brands that are using palm oil in many cases willfully and not caring, <coughs> and the brands that are either palm oil or certified sustainable. So those are some really good places to start with shopping. Deforestationeducation.org. And another one of many others is rainforestalliance.org, and they have a tab about conflict Yes. Um, there was recently an unsuccessful effort in the courts to establish a certain personhood in primates. Uh, can you talk about whether you think establishing that type of legal concept would have any benefits? What sort of benefits it might have? Um, that's a case that uh, took place in the United States, and the um, chimps that would benefit from that are chimps that are in captivity 
in the United States, especially those being used in the entertainment industry and invasive medical research. And it would benefit them enormously because they would then no longer be able to exploit them in that way because they would have rights of personhood. Um, it would not benefit apes in Africa or in Southeast Asia. And unfortunately, granting human rights to apes in some of these countries won't change much for them in the, in, in the short term because human rights aren't respected in many of these countries, even for human rights, and, um, and, and for women, and for LGBT people, and for all sorts of other people. So before they start extending it to non-humans, it's going to take a while. But it, it is an approach. And the thing that I believe is that there is no one single strategy that's going to solve the problems of the world. We need many strategies. And we need some radical strategies, and we need some very mundane strategies. We need to be really doing everything that, that we can. And I certainly, personally believe that it's, it's a very good start in the US and in Europe um, to be pushing for the rights of animals. And there's actually one court in, I believe it was Argentina, that granted um, rights to a chimpanzee. And she was taken out of the very poor captive situation that she was in. And they are hoping to get her into a, a decent sanctuary. She'd been in captivity for, for many, many years. So it's one of the many strategies that we need. Yes, all the way in the back. Your thoughts on poaching? My thoughts on poaching? Um, in Africa, it's a huge problem, um, poaching of apes. Um, and by poaching, it's illegal killing and illegal hunting. Um, apes are legally protected in every single country where they're found in the wild. So that you may not kill them. Yet they are being killed and hunted in a lot of countries. And actually, not just in Africa, even in Indonesia now, they're finding that the numbers of orangutans that are being killed for food and for other reasons as problem animals because of crop rating is actually far higher than, than was thought before. So poaching is illegal. The problem is that poaching for many people and hunting is their only source of food. Now, not necessarily killing apes is their only source of food. And apes are protected, and they may not. They're not allowed to. And they are allowed to kill many other animals, hunt other animals that are not protected. So I think we have to take a nuanced approach to poaching. We have to remember that for many people, it's their only source of food. So just saying you're not allowed to is not going to help them at all. And it's, it's even unethical to say that. You need to look at alternatives. What are the alternatives? Help them do small animal husbandry, find ways in which, whether it's fish culture or other things, find ways in which they can get animal protein if their diet requires protein, so that they can get it in legal means and don't have to illegally kill protected species. Yes, in the uh, I think a lot of people don't really, don't cook with palm oil necessarily. Palm oil shows up in packaged goods, and I just wanted to say that I almost never eat popcorn, but I was in the mood for some, maybe the first time in years, <laughs> and I went to the grocery store, and I was astonished how much palm oil is in every single, especially the microwave popcorns, also the packaged cookies, the chips of white, all of the cookies that are commonly bought are packed with palm oil, so if people will look at the labels, more yeah. than they do, they will find out that they're consuming yeah. a lot of palm oil. Very bad for you, too, actually. Yeah. Palm oil is also used as a biofuel in, the, in many countries across Europe. So it's actually a very, very important source of green fuel, which is more destructive probably than um, you know, uh, fuels from the, from the ground. That's you had mentioned earlier in your talk that you, uh, to paraphrase, I think, you saw the future of wildlife conservation as incorporating development and human development. And can you, just from your experiences, can you show some examples of where you saw that working in whatever country you were in, where where human or economic development was was tailored into wildlife conservation? I can um, give you examples of where they're trying 
to do it. Um, I'm, I'm not that many examples are can really be qualified as success stories just because it takes a long time. And all of these things are relatively new initiatives. But for example, in Sabah, in Malaysia, which is on the north of, of Borneo, there's an excellent program um, working <coughs> along the um, Kinabatangan River, trying to link patches of forest, fragments of forest, and reforest corridors between them, and working with palm oil companies and with villagers to create viable <coughs> corridors for elephants, for orangutans, for all sorts of other, uh, of other species, and to protect enough forest so that from coast to the higher altitude mountains, there's a continuous band of forest so that wildlife populations can move through. And they're working with palm oil companies, with individual farmers, um, to try and find solutions, buying land where necessary, and also trying to change the way those palm oil companies are deforesting in the areas where they're deforesting so that they don't go right up to the edges of the river, which is illegal anyway. But they often do go right up to the edges of the river because it makes it so much easier than to transport the goods using the riverways. And developing good, viable businesses with those local communities, whether they're based on, on production, agriculture, whether they're based on um, uh, processing different products, or whether it's tourism and other services, trying to develop good, viable economic activities with those communities so people diversify their, their livelihood. It's a relatively small geographic area, but it's a good example of trying to figure out that this is not about this forest is just for the wildlife and no people get to go there. You guys get to, you know, live here. It's about trying to make people understand the benefits of the forest. Why is the forest good for them and how can they benefit from the forest? And at the same time, how can we still continue to help lift them out of poverty? So it's the, the, the framework within which you try to do conservation and you try to do to do it in a in a realistic context. That's not ignoring the fact that we have seven point five billion people on this planet. Yes. Yeah, you said uh, that you estimated we would need about one point three million kilometers square of additional agricultural land. And I, I can't really picture what that is. Like if you were to if you were to lay over a map of Europe or you know something like that, can you can you put that into a scale? I think it's bigger than Europe. <laughs> I mean, I, it's big. It's yeah. I I I'm sorry. I I can't really. Uh, I don't know exactly how big Europe is, but it's a huge area of land. It's it's the Amazon basin and the Congo basin. If you were to really look at the land that's needed to feed this almost doubling of the human population in the status quo, in the way in which we're doing things now, that's the amount of land that would be required. So we would lose vast areas of, of what's forest today. And that will have inevitable consequences on the climate and on temperatures and on availability of water and conflict and <coughs> everything. I mean, it, it will affect <coughs> as much as everything else. Yes. Um, so into that question, I think just wanted your um, input on animal agriculture industry, particularly in terms of this forest deforestation and destruction of areas, and that might maybe what you were part of what you're talking about with the um, the Amazon basin and the Congo. But anyway, speak about that animal animal agriculture industry. Uh, and the what do you mean with the animal agriculture industry? So the, pr the uh, production of animals for food. All oh, right. Okay. Um, yeah. I mean that uses vast swathes of land because you, you basically, if you're going to have cattle or, or other um, animals, livestock, you, you need grasslands, and that means converting forests into into grasslands. And many of the areas where that's been done. Um, when you take tropical forests, many of the tropical forests in the world are on very thin <coughs> layers of soil, and they basically can, can support such an uh, enormous vegetation because of the constant leaf litter that's falling down and, in, and enriching the soil and the slow movement of the water across the, across the land. When you cut those forests, what you do is very quickly lose that thin layer of topsoil, and the soil becomes incredibly poor very quickly, and you lose a lot from erosion, from air erosion or water erosion, 
and the lawyer, the land becomes very degraded very quickly, and then isn't actually rich enough to support your populations of cows or whatever it is you, you are um, you have on that on that land. And so, very often people have discovered that cutting the forest doesn't give you either agricultural land or grassland, pasture land for very long, and then it becomes so poor that you have to basically go somewhere else and cut more forest. So it's a very destructive conversion. <coughs> Yeah, one more. Yes? When I first looked at your graph showing fairly constant uh, line for industrialized countries and an enormous growth up to 2050, <coughs> I thought, how can this be? Uh, because developing nations, many of them are now achieving middle class in some of their populations and increased uh, urbanization, which results in fewer children. What's wrong, what's, why is my thinking incorrect? It, why well, is thus uh, uh, increased uh, urbanization and industrialization not going to help solve this problem? So it's a simple answer, half the world's under 25. <laughs> Half the world is under 25, and so it's you know a lot of that growth is residual growth of yeah, uh, the past. It's a time lag. A lot of those kids were born many years ago, but they're just now reaching their reproductive age. So there, even if they just replace themselves, you know, it's it, it's going to continue to grow because they'll be alive as well. So there'll be a period of time in which that happens. The the models. I mean, the, the big difference between when I was a grad student or an undergrad. And now, as back then, we had no idea where we might level off. Now we're at least thinking it's going to be between 9 and 10 billion, and then decline. Another great eight question? Yes. Um, what do you think is the most effective tactic of um, creating those feelings of uh, emotional bonding and caring and bringing these things into our circle? Oh, that's a very difficult question, and, and, I, and I don't know if I know the answer. I think it, different things work for different people, and that's part of the challenge. Um, you know, for some people, if you give them information and you appeal to their mind, their intellect, they'll figure it out and they'll go, yes, no, this doesn't make sense, this isn't good, and they will actually change their behavior. And they'll actually say, no, we've got to do something about this. Other people, you can tell them until you're blue in the face and it doesn't change their behavior, and they need to have that emotional connection. They need to be touched by something. They need to feel it viscerally and in their heart. And the only thing that works, in my experience, is those intimate, personal stories. It's hearing about an animal that learns to break snares, to protect his babies, and to actually see that, and to actually experience that, and to say, this is incredible, this is phenomenal, this is not an animal that we can just you know, let disappear. Um, so for some people it's the emotion, for some people it's the mind, and for some people it's just incredibly difficult. <laughs> I'm not sure everybody is open to it. You know, when you think of the people that exist on this planet that abuse and torture other animals and other human beings, you think, how are you ever going to reach them? Like, what, what is it that they need to feel compassion and empathy and caring? For, for other beings. And, and I think it's just a really complicated um, issue. And, and I think, again, we need to try different tactics with different people. But we need to be wise about it, and we need to be bold about it, because I think we need to dare talk about empathy and compassion and the emotion, and not just remain in our comfortable scientific seats. Because as scientists, and Javas will um, probably agree, it's so easy to talk about the data and the, you know, the models and, and all of that. We're very comfortable with it. It's, it's something we've studied, we've generated the, the information, we can share it with everybody, and that, that's comfortable. It's when you expose yourself and you get tears in your eyes or you get choked up emotionally because you've had an experience that has meant something to you, and you share that with other people, that's harder and that's less comfortable. And I think we need to be better at doing that because I think that is, at the end of the day, sometimes what communication is. <coughs>
Um, so I'd like to thank Annette for uh, influencing 150 people tonight and getting us closer to our emotional connection uh, to the sentient beings of the Earth other than humans. And thank her again for a great talk. Thank you.